All right. So today we're talking about web design. And this is the lecture for the intro to the World Wide Web. Um, it's real, actually, it's easy to say that you do or you don't like a website. One of the goals in this class is to help you describe what it is, to give you the vocabulary and the background knowledge to talk a little bit more in depth about what makes a user like or dislike a website. Um, and the other goal is to really, in this part of the class, is to help you understand what the basic construction of a website is. So let's talk about vocabulary first. Since the introduction of the web, um, the vocabulary that we see used on a daily basis has changed dramatically. A lot of these terms simply did not exist 10 years ago. I mean, if, you know, 10 years ago, Google, Twitter, Facebook, Foursquare, Pandora, a lot of these terms didn't weren't very popular. Nobody really knew what they were. Um, thanks to the internet and the spread of um, the internet, all of these terms that we are familiar with today um, have become very commonplace and become very much you know used in regular conversation. You talk about searching for something, a lot of times you'll hear someone say, I googled it, um, and that just simply means to search for it. Um, and so a lot of these terms have really become just sort of commonplace because of the internet and because of how they're used. Um, so, you know, and even, even things like the icons for things, the stumble upon icon, the Twitter or Facebook blogs bot, and this particular one, there's no text on this one, but it's synonymous. I mean, if you know anything about, um, web development, this is, you know, this stands for uh, an RSS feed. And so a lot of these things, even though they're not really even words, are vocabulary terms that we recognize and we see as users, um, and even though they're just maybe the first letter or a short little icon, um, but they're, they've become part of our vocabulary over the course of time. Um, really quickly, I'm going to post these to Blackboard as supplemental. They are three short videos on how sort of they talk about the history of the internet and then a couple of videos on how the internet works and what the internet really is. Um, and to kind of go on what the internet really is, we have to kind of answer the question, what is the difference between the internet and the web? Now a lot of people don't think there is a difference, but really in the technical sense, there is. The internet is the physical network of computers. That would be the wires, the cables, the modems, everything that connects all these computers together is the internet. And really, I mean, if you watch those videos from the previous slide, the internet is explained quite well in those as being a wire um, being a connection between computers or between server and client. Um, the internet physical network supports a number of different protocols um, or if you want to use layman's terms methods of data transfer. Um, and some of these methods you're familiar with email, FTP, gaming such as Xbox Live, PS3, now PS4, um, online gaming, and then one of those protocols that is supported by the internet, that physical network of computers, is the World Wide Web. And the World Wide Web is an HTTP protocol. Um, and we'll learn a little bit more about what HTTP is and what it does a little bit later. So Tim Berners-Lee is the man credited with creating the World Wide Web. He first proposed it in 1989. Um, and then subsequently, after the development was established, he became the director of the W3C. Uh, and here's a quote from Tim Berners-Lee. He says, the social value of the web is that it enables human communication, commerce, and opportunities to share knowledge. So what is the W3C? 
W3C stands for World Wide Web Consortium. It was created in 1994, and its, its primary role is to maintain the web standards. Um, that would be standards like HTML, CSS, and even within HTML versions such as XHTML, HTML5, um, and then some of the other web standards you would see commonly on there. Um, CSS2, CSS3, those kinds of things. So it maintains those standards and it kind of oversees the process of developing those standards. So currently the W3C is in the process of standardizing and maintaining a standard for HTML5. Um, and if you haven't heard or, ha or don't already know, HTML5 is still technically a, an experimental um, code. Um, so it's not yet the standard. It is very widely used and almost any new website that's building these in the last probably two or three years has used HTML5. Um, I don't know why they don't bother just going ahead and making it the standard, but it's still technically under development, it's still technically experimental, um, but everybody uses it. So for the purposes of this class, we can learn HTML5 and use HTML5. Um, and we'll talk more about what HTML5 is and how it compares to older versions uh, at a later date also. So as we're talking about the web, we're talking about essentially websites. Um, and let's talk a little bit about the history of websites first. So <clears throat> 1989, Tim Berners-Lee um, develops this idea for the, the World Wide Web. Hypertext was developed about that time. Um, in 1990, the first search engine was developed called Archie. Um, then in 92, the Mosaic browser, um, Mark Andreessen, developed. 1994, Yahoo started breaking down content on the World Wide Web into categories, so you could categorize things. Up until that point, the Mosaic browser brought in a visual aspect to it. Before 1992, anything was on, that was on the internet was primarily just text. There wasn't a lot of images. Mosaic allowed a visual aspect to be brought in so you could combine images with text. Yahoo added the categories so you could sort things and search for things within, you know, you could search within a category. 1998, Google kind of adva advanced on the categories and the search engine by making it super fast. They figured out a way to, to search very quickly. Um, in 2001, the introduction of the iPod um, isn't really doesn't really at that point have much of an effect on websites, but we'll see as it be, as it progressed, it became like the iPod Touch. Um, you see sort of a progression to being able to see and view websites on iPod, and of course later on in 2007 we see the iPhone. Um, but the iPod kind of got things rolling for the the iTunes websites or the iTunes website. Um, in 2003, uh, you, you saw the introduction of MySpace, which was one of the very first social networking sites on the internet. It was very, it was, it was, it was revolutionary um, for people people to be able to communicate and post things and talk and and share stuff like that on a website. There weren't that many sites, and the sites that did exist before MySpace simply weren't very good. Um, 2004, we see the introduction of Flickr. Flickr enabled the average user to post their pictures online. Before that, if you wanted to post any pictures online, you kind of either had to have your own host, um, pay for your own hosting, or go through somebody's hosting page. And there wasn't really a sort of a public domain area for a public display of your photos, which like is what Flickr kind of enabled the average user access to. Um, we saw the introduction of Facebook on the Harvard campus, and Firefox was introduced by Mozilla. Now, Mozilla had been in the web browser game for a while. They had a few browsers before Firefox that never really caught on, but for some reason, Firefox took hold, and everybody started jumping on board, um, and it started taking market share away from the other browsers of the time, um, primarily Internet Explorer being the primary shareholder at that point. Um, in 2005, the introduction of YouTube had a very similar, uh, very similar effect as Flickr did on, 
on video. It allowed the average user to post their video to the internet without providing or without paying for their own hosting or their own services. Um, and YouTube was, of course, was free, and so everybody jumped on there and started sharing YouTube videos. And of course, that led to what we know today. I mean, there's YouTube stars that that's what they have to make their living is putting videos up and getting paid for it. Uh, 2006, Twitter was open to, sorry, Facebook was open to everyone and Twitter was introduced. Twitter, of course, being the, these 120 characters, um, short bursts of information. 2007, with the, the introduction of the iPhone, really changed the way people started looking at websites. It was the first time anyone really ever thought about viewing websites on a mobile device. And it was very revolutionary um, because you see what happened six ish, seven years later. Now, website browsers on, on smartphones are huge. Um, and a lot of what you view the web on is a mobile device. Not as many people use desktop or laptop computers anymore. So the iPhone was very revolutionary when it came to websites because people had to start thinking about formatting a website for a variety of different monitor sizes. So you now had to start thinking smaller. You had to start thinking, okay, this is rotating left. You know, you can rotate widescreen, you can rotate tall screen. Um, how's, the, how's the website going to react to that? And how's it going to make itself fit? Um, and so we really saw a dramatic change in the development of websites based on the introduction of the iPhone and that mobile market. And then in 2009, we saw cloud computing, um, which is essentially internet or web-based storage. Um, Google Docs was one of the first. Microsoft has its cloud. Um, Amazon has a cloud service. Um, and so that is, uh, we can probably come up with a few more sort of benchmarks since 2009. Um, but things are developing at such a rate at this point, there's not really, hasn't been a, a huge, huge um, sort of outbreak of oh, new information or new ideas. But they'll be coming. Um, really quickly looking at web browser statistics. Um, this graphic was pulled from the Next Web website stating that, um, well, they're looking at the Firefox worldwide market share. Um, According to this statistic, Internet Explorer still has a significant hold on the worldwide market share for browsers. Firefox being next and then followed by Chrome, Safari, and Opera, and I don't know what the others. Others are probably older versions of a variety of different browsers. Maybe there's still people using uh, Netscape Navigator, who knows. Um, the W3 Schools also has its own set of graphic that I just showed you. Um, their statistics, according to December 2013, show Internet Explorer having a 9% market share, which is significantly different than the graphic we just saw. Firefox at 26%, Chrome at 55%. Um, now, this is somebody else's uh, statistics, and so I can't be sure exactly where they're getting this information. Um, but they, you can kind of trace it back to when some of these were developed. Um, you can see, start to see these lines fading in and, or disappearing and, and reappearing as other things. So Mozilla disappeared, Chrome appears. And so now we're really dealing with five different browsers and realistically there's probably three browsers that are really the the common ones that are being used. Kind of a, a humorous take on the history of web browsers um, and the current state of web browsers. There's a comparison of browsers that the five most common ones that you see in use. Um, it's kind of humorous. And then we see a map of the browser wars, which some of you may not even be old enough to remember Netscape or AOL or Internet Explorer 4, which was horrendous. But, you know, back in those days, that was what it was. It wasn't really anything different to compare to. Um, so now looking back, we can kind of see, okay, this is, what, this is what happened. This is what they were like. So it's just kind of a humorous take on the history of web browsers and web browsers themselves. Taking sort of a different turn, 
when it comes to user experience on the web, there are essentially three levels um, to which you can achieve this richness of user experience. At the bottom, at the very basic level, you have content. Content would simply be text, images, links, that kind of thing. Content is produced and presented by the HTML. That's the sole purpose of HTML. Well, primary purpose of HTML is to display the content. Um, if, you're in, if you're thinking about how it's going to look, you're actually moving on to the second layer, which is presentation. And presentation is accomplished using the CSS. So the CSS deals with things like colors, layout, um, columns, fonts, font sizes and colors and borders and you know rounded corners and drop shadows. Um, presentation can even deal with some behavioral issues like rollovers. What happens when you mouse over a link? Does it change color? That kind of thing. So that's your second level of, of richness. And then the third level is simply behavior. The behavior is primarily accomplished by JavaScript. Um, some of the newer code that's being used is called jQuery. jQuery actually uses JavaScript to accomplish behavioral things and you can have it do it's a responsive thing. So you click something on a website, what happens? Does the background change color? Does the does something slide? Does something move when you mouse over it? Does something you know um, a good example of that would be on the UNL website when you mouse over the red menu bar at the top of the page, it drops down and you have a bunch of sub-menu options. That's a behavior. That's a response to a user input. And that's accomplished using JavaScript. Some other terms that we want to be aware of, um, HTML, XHTML, um, our programming, are not technically not programming. They're the markup language that we use to display the content. CSS, by the way, HTML stands for Hypertext Markup language. It's not really a programming language, it's a markup language, and we'll talk about that in another lecture about specifically about HTML. CSS stands for cascading style sheets, and the style is really the key word there. Style, they are used to style a web page, to create its layout, its design. URI, um, URL is technically a deprecated term according to the W3C, um, but Everybody really still knows it as URL. It stands for Universal Resource Locator. Um, and it's essentially a link. It's a URL is a link to a web page or a website. HTTP, HTTP is the hypertext transfer protocol. It's, it's the language that computers use to communicate on the web. FTP, FTP stands for file transfer protocol. That's Excuse me. That's the protocol that's used to transfer files between a server and a, a client. If you're uploading a file to your website and you want to do it quickly, FTP would probably be the best thing to use. And you can get clients, and clients will connect through an FTP protocol to the server from your computer, and then you can just move files back and forth. Um, because technically, a, a file on your computer is not live on the web. You should probably already know that. The only way to make it live on the web is to upload it to a server that's directly connected to the internet. Domain names. We've talked about domain names before. Um, Google.com is a domain. I have a domain. My name, my domain is alanino.com. I bought that 13, 14 years ago. Um, and I've just kept it and maintained it. And you basically don't own a domain. You, you kind of basically rent them because you pay to keep it registered in your name. Host. Host is the um, the server that you would use to put your website on would be termed a, would be called a host. Uh, web 2.0 is an interesting term for sort of the second version of internet web pages. Pixels, and we'll talk about pixels and vector and bitmapped image. We've talked a little bit about those um, earlier, and we'll talk more about them. Sort of the difference between vector and bitmapped, and basically the understanding. Uh, that I want you to have is that pixels create bitmapped graphics or raster graphics. And then of course color spaces being the two main ones that we're working with in this class are CMYK and RGB. Some test 
te excuse me. Te wow. Technical aspects of that you want to be thinking about when you're working on the web is three questions. Do files download quickly? And this has to do with creating web content. Are the typographical and visual messages appropriate and interesting? And does the website contain useful and engaging information? Those are some basic questions that you want every web developer needs to be asking themselves because you don't want your content to take a long time to download. Your users are going to get bored or frustrated. Um, if the messages are inappropriate or boring, same result. And if the site doesn't contain useful information, same result. Some challenges for web designers. The primary challenge anymore really is not browsers, it's not environments, and not really connection speeds. Those are some historical challenges that have sort of been kind of smoothed out. Everybody's got a fast connection anymore. Although, to be honest, there are still people who have slow, like my grandparents still have a 56K modem that they use and dial into the internet. It's ridiculously slow. They can't even watch YouTube videos. So there is that consideration still. Um, platforms, the difference between, you know, Apple, IO, Apple OS, Microsoft, um, Windows, Linux, some users. I mean, and now you're talking with mobile devices, you're talking about iOS, you're talking about Android. Um, and all of those platforms have, have different ways of displaying web pages and websites and their browsers are inherently different. Um, so user environments can be different um, depending on how their computer is set up or how their device is set up. Screen resolutions are probably the biggest challenge at this point for web designers. And that really simply comes out of the development of mobile for, you know, mobile browsing. Um, browsing web pages on a mobile device those screens are small. So you have to figure out how does your website convert into a small screen? Does it resize? Does it reformat? Does it do a combination of those things? Um, and one of the latest uh, sort of things you can concentrate on with web design is called responsive design. And that's really making a website re respond to the monitor, that it, to the display that it's being shown on. So the website itself would be smart and goes out and figures, okay, I'm being shown on a laptop screen, I'm gonna do this. Or I'm being shown on a Android phone, I'm gonna do this, this size, I'm gonna do this. Um, and then of course, monitor color. Um, but screen sizes are a big deal. And you, you can see this really sort of confusing graphic that shows a ton of different available screen sizes in different ratios, just different aspect ratios, different resolutions. And some of these really aren't even used anymore. Um, and some of these are pretty regularly used, like here's a 1920 by 1080. That's a 1080 HD 1080, that's your full HD television size. Um, we have, I mean, even PAL in here, some of these, if you guys are not familiar with the difference between NTSC and PAL, that's a whole nother ball of worm. Um, but we won't probably get into that. But that is, there are sizes that are standards outside of the US. Um, here's your HD 720. And then you have some of these smaller ones are cell phone sizes, CGA 320 by 200. Um, and so you've got all these different screen sizes to think about and deal with. And this is why I say one of the most pressing challenges for web designers anymore is what size of screen is it gonna be displayed on? What's the, what's the aspect ratio? What's the resolution? You know what that's a that's a big deal some different disciplines that you'll run into there are basically two disciplines in web development there is front-end design and that deals with graphics that deals with colors that deals with layout and style and all of the things that come with actual design of a page how does the page look how does the page feel how does the page respond and then back-end development and back-end development is, is essentially how do you make it look like the front end design designer wants? How do you make it respond in a specific way? How do you make the layout look specifically? How do you make these colors? How do you make this? How do you do 
what do you write in order to make the front end look like it's supposed to? Um, and this kind of brings us to the development process of the web. Because the primary development really has to come from the front end. The primary, the first thing you want to do when you're developing a website is do some research and just conceptualize. Um, so figure out what you want the website to look like. Do some research, look at other sites and say, okay, I like this type of design, I don't like this type of design. You know, figure out what you like and figure out what's maybe even, maybe even more important than what you like is figure out what works. You gotta go do some research and see what other people doing the same type of content and the same type of website are, are producing. What do their sites look, work, look like? Do they work? If they don't work, what could they do better? And what can you do better on your site to make it a better site? Then of course you have to create and organize your content and some of that in some instances you have to create it in some sense instances you simply have to pull it together and organize it. Um, and then you start developing what the site looks like. You decide where your menu is going to go, you decide your color theme, you decide your fonts. You, 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 do, you make all the design decisions and you start pulling it together and you build some um, test uh, designs. And then you do user testing on those test designs. And one of the user tests you can use on the, the look and feel of a site is called simply the look and feel test. And really, that is the most basic test you want to perform on a website um, because that takes a, basically it takes graphical representations of what the website would look like and it gets user feedback on how they look, how they, how they make them feel. It really has absolutely nothing to do with the workings of a website. It's not even a functional website, it's just a, an image, a sketch, or a wireframe. And we'll talk about wireframes in a little bit. Um, but that look and feel test is simply a series of graphic designs that you get feedback on the look and feel. Um, and then from there you go to produce an actual working web site prototype. So you build a website itself and then you test it again. Um, and you're testing for quality, you're testing for how things work, you're going back to users and saying, okay, um, we want to know if this website looks good, whether it functions. That's when you start looking at the functionality of it. And you can do that through a number of different tests. You can use focus groups basically look more at sort of the design of the site and the feel and the, the look of the site. Um, but tests like observed behavior, task-oriented tests, um, there's one test called the trunk test, which is very interesting. Um, and the, the basis behind why it's called the trunk test is imagine you were stuck in the trunk of a car and driven around for 20 minutes and then dropped somewhere. You have to then figure out where you are and how to get back to where you started. So that's essentially what happens in a trunk test on a website. You're dropped in on a page somewhere buried in the website you then have to figure out where you are on the site, you know, what section are you in, um, if you're not in, what subsection are you in, if you're not in a subsection, you know, where, where are you on the site, and then how do you get back to the home page. Um, and so the goal as the developer, your goal, is to make it very, very easy for the tester to figure out where they are and to find out where, how to get back to home. Um, then observe things like observe behavior where you just let someone play with the site and you just watch and see what they click on, see what they want to do, see where they go. Um, can tell you a lot of information about how well a website is built and organized. And then task oriented where they, it's just a bit beyond observe behavior. You tell them to do something. You say find uh, an email address, find the address for this company, find some portfolio pieces or a resume. And then you see how long it takes them. It's, you see where they want to click, where they think they should click. Um, and then, you know, when they eventually get there, how did they get there? What's the, what are the steps that they took to get there? And then the second to last process in, or step in the process is to launch the site. It's not the last step because the last step is actually maintenance. Um, and maintenance on a website is just as important as any of the other steps, if not more important, because... How is your site going to survive if you don't update it? If you're not maintaining it, if you're not adding new content, if you're just static and sitting and not doing anything, it's going to get boring and people are going to stop coming. 
So maintenance is probably your primary, really, the, that's the big thing. That's the thing that's going to keep you working on a website for years and years. Um, and then, of course, it's always the rebuilding and redeveloping and reincorporating new concepts. Um, a lot of websites now that have been around for years, particularly the UNL website, um, and we're right in the middle of this process this year, um, is reconstructing in a mobile-friendly format. Um, the prior, the previous version of the UNL website template was not mobile friendly. Um, the new version is. So the new version is, of course, being rolled out over the next year um, to enable it to be that dynamic, um, responsive design that looks good on a mobile device and looks good on a laptop and looks good on a desktop. And, and so that's, that's sort of the next step. And you're always uh, with websites, you're always developing, and so you're always finding something new that you can inc incorporate or use, or that you should incorporate, or that you should use. So really quick, 10 principles of web design that are v of effective web design. Number one, and these are from Smashing Magazine, um, but the textbook called Don't Make Me Think is also has these in there. Um, and the primary first one is the whole basis for that book. Um, it's called Don't Make Users Think. Essentially, exactly what it means. People don't want to think when they go to a website. They don't want to have to think about where they need to click. They don't want to have to think about what does what. What does this button do? I don't know. So maybe I won't try it. Um, don't squander their patience. And that goes along with making them think. The more someone has to think about a website, the more it uses up their patience. Um, you want to make sure you focus users' attention. You can do that using a variety of techniques on the web. Um, and we'll talk about some design concepts that you can use to kind of help do that. Strive for feature exposure. So the most important thing on your site, what, how do you expose that? What do you do to make that prominent? That's got to be, and we talked a little bit about you know, visual hierarchy on a website or on a design. Same is true for features on a website. You want to have that visual hierarchy so that those features are the most prominent, visual, most important thing that the user's eye can see. Make use of effective writing. And effective writing on the web, typically you would sort of inter interpret that as being short, succinct, straight to the point. No, you don't need a lot of fluff or um, what my English teacher in high school called popcorn writing. To, to get users' attention. Strive for simplicity, and that goes right along in the same tone as effective writing. Simplicity in writing as well as simplicity of design. You don't need a real complicated design to get your effect, um, to get your point across. Don't be afraid of white space. White space is a very good thing. Um, helps elements breathe, and it keeps the website simply adding white space and keeps the website visibly uncluttered for the most part. Um, communicate with a visual language, visible language. The, web's, the web is a visual format. There's no doubt about it that pictures work much better than text. So if you can say something with a picture, um, you're much better off using that. Conventions are your friend. You know, conventions would be people, people instinctively know that the top left corner, that site ID is a home button. 99% of websites out there, you have that site ID in the top left corner, you click it, it'll take you to the home page. Conventions like that are definitely going to be your friend. Um, if you see a picture of a house, that's probably a home button. If you see a picture of a letter, like an envelope, that's probably an email button. You know, those types of conventions that are, have become over time just commonplace and everybody just kind of understands what they mean. Use them. They will definitely be to your advantage. Um, and the last one, test early, test often, test variety of things, test using a variety of tests. Just test. That's, that's probably the most important thing you can do on a website is, is continue to test. So some basic website structure. Um, I have a couple examples here at the bottom of the page. We have a simple website. It's basically uh, five HTML pages, a CSS page, and some images. That's a very basic folder structure. Um, you see the, the root folder, and then you see an images folder, and then all of your HTML files are there. This is a much more complex website. Um, 
this is actually an old version of the College of Journalism site where we have things categorized by different things. We've got a folder for forms, we've got an images folder, we've got, we've got backups and all kinds of strange things in here. We've got a folder for alumni, we've got a folder for faculty bios and check out, I didn't know what that is. Um, anyway, so a complex website it still needs to be structurally organized as far as the folders go. Um, and it just really helps the developer and anybody working on the website to kind of understand the structure to say, okay, I know all of my bio pictures and information are going to be in this bios folder. So they're not spread out through different folders on the site. They're not all out in the root folder where they just get mixed in with every other file in the site. That can get really confusing really quickly, especially with a large website. Um, and to kind of back up on the page a little bit, templates can use, you can use templates, um, HTML templates to maintain consistency over an entire website. Um, and templates essentially maintain certain parts of the website that are all the same from page to page. And you would use them for things like your header, menu, footer, those kinds of elements, which you want to be consistent on every page of the site. Um, the nice thing about using an HTML template is then you can you make a change in one place and it sort of propagates itself to the other pages and updates the other pages. So you don't have to change every single page on a 50-page website. You change the template HTML and then that changes all the other pages that are sort of dependent on it. And the same works for linked CSS documents. Um, the HTML pages refer to the template, which refers to the CSS for its styling. And so it saves you a lot of time when you're using a template and an external CSS page to make the changes that you want to make very quickly and have it propagate throughout the entire site without doing a lot of work. Um, so web hosting, there's a number of different options um, for web hosting. We'll talk about in class some of the options. We actually have a really good option for you um, as a UNL student uh, discounted rate. Um, we'll talk about the web hosting in class, but in order to have a website you have to have some form of web hosting. And for most people that means buying a server or buying space on a server somewhere um, and paying you know like a yearly fee to maintain that server space and registering a domain. And you, the, the important thing to note here is you cannot have a website without a domain and hosting. Um, a lot of people end up buying one or the other and not realizing you have to have both in order for a website to be actually existing. Um, you can buy web hosting but until you get a domain and point it at it nobody can, can see the content. And you can buy a domain but until you get the hosting and put content in there that domain doesn't show any, it doesn't, there's nothing to show. Um, and then, of course, the last thing we're going to talk about is wireframes, and we'll talk about the wireframes in class because that'll be our assignment, part of our assignment for this week. Wireframes are basically a sketch. They're a visual guide to what a website might look like. Um, it's the layout of the fundamental elements of the interface, um, and it helps you maintain consistency when you're designing like sub pages for your site too, to, to work with wireframes. The important thing to note on a wireframe really is the amount of detail the level of detail that you can input into this wireframe, the more detail that you can get in there, the easier it's going to be to convert to an actual HTML CSS page. So that's it for our introduction to HTML, or the World Wide Web. Sorry, not just HTML. Next week we'll talk about HTML. Um, we'll see you in class.